we alter communion today. And for those who are joining us online, I would just remind you that we do appreciate if you mail us a, a little note saying that you did commune today, so your communion can be recorded. It is the day when we collect on behalf of the Line Mountain Food Bank. I see we have a table that's just loaded with donations back there. So I want to thank everyone who brought something to contribute. We all know that's a good cause. Uh, just turning to the calendar of events for this week, the women will resume meeting after the customary winter hiatus. That will be tomorrow evening. Uh, the Lenten service this Wednesday will be at Trinity Dalmatia next Sunday. Well, first of all, a reminder that the time changes. So if you don't remember to reset your clocks, you will be just in time for the um, um, refreshments and fellowship. And instead of the, uh, the service next Sunday. So uh, um, remember to do that. And also, next Sunday, we will have the rescheduled temple talk about Elijah's bowl. I know some of us were looking forward to that, and our presenter, Tegan, was ill last week and unable to be with us. So she'll, she's planning to be here next week. Um, also, we are changing the date when we take collections on behalf of the backpack program to better coordinate with our other collections. Uh, we're going to try doing the backpack program on the second Sunday of the month instead of the third Sunday as has been our customary time. So that'll be next week also and I wanted to just share the current needs because we do have an update uh, for those of you who um, like to contribute to that. To keep in mind as you do your grocery shopping and those online are welcome to drop off a contribution anytime during the week. And the most needed items are juice boxes, cereal cups, individual packets of oatmeal, uh, small pasta cans, uh, soup cans, small vegetable cans, individual packs of macaroni and cheese, jello cups, the little individual packs of raisins, um, chicken and tuna, small cans, and the small packs of applesauce. And that would be the complete list at the present time. So we're going to update the bulletin for next week, but I wanted you to have that today. Okay, notice the shoebox ministry for March. We're collecting hygiene items, tissues, band-aids, combs, and hairbrushes. Uh, the trip to track from the anniversary year, kind of a, a, an ongoing uh, uh, celebration of our heritage. That is going to be Tuesday, April the 16th. If anyone would like to participate in that, you can see Dan Schwalm after church today. Uh, if you didn't sign up with the original list, it should be a, a fascinating day to further explore our history and heritage. And Milestone Sunday is scheduled for June the 2nd. It's not too early to start thinking about that. If you have anyone to include this year, please see Peggy as soon as possible. And um, we um, will be happy to recognize your youth. And speaking of recognition of our youth, we had several of our youth that were very proud of them who had key roles in the production of Footloose at Line Mountain, which was this past weekend. And that was Evan Swinehart and both Caitlin and Kylie Troutman. And I think the kids all had like a really late night last night after the play until they tore everything down. So I'm not sure we have anyone from that group here with us this morning, but it might still be nice to give them a round of applause. Okay, any other announcements before we turn to the prayer list additions? And we have several persons to add. Evelyn Rothermull, who is here this morning, but she is preparing for hip surgery on Thursday. So we'll appreciate prayers, especially on that day. Uh, Jackson Schlosser, um, the newborn in the ICU, is doing a little better, I've heard. There's uh, an update on him. So he was on the prayer chain earlier in the week, and I think those prayers did help uh, the little guy. And then we're adding Tim and Joyce Masser. Uh, Tim was recently diagnosed with skin cancer, and Joyce, his wife, 
has a number of chronic illness, is in care in a nursing home, and currently has sepsis. So um, uh, we have some really uh, uh, strong needs for prayer this week, as we customarily do. Anyone else to add? Okay, well, seeing that, oh, yes, Robin. Okay, what's his wife's name? Latshaw. Okay. Okay, be happy to add her. Okay, well then I would invite everyone to continue to prepare for worship by listening to our prelude. Please stand, if you are able, for our morning confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. 
we keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred for all these things and for sins only you know. Forgive us, Lord. Amen. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. The first lesson is written in, oh, excuse me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The first lesson is written in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, found in the Old Testament Pew Bible, page 87. God spoke, and these were his words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Were you were slaves. Worship no God but me. Do not make for yourselves images of anything in heaven or on earth or in the water under the earth. 
Do not bow down to any idol or worship it, because I am the Lord your God, and I tolerate no rivals. I bring punishment on those who hate me and on their descendants down to the third and fourth generation. But I show my love to thousands of generations of those who love me and obey my laws. Do not use my name for evil purposes, for I, the Lord your God, will punish anyone who misuses my name. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the seas, and everything in them, but on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Respect your father and your mother so that you may live a long time in the land that I'm giving you. Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not accuse anyone falsely. Do not desire another man's house. Do not desire his wife, his slaves, his cattle, his donkeys, or anything else that he owns. The word of the Lord. Let us read responsively Psalm 19 as printed in the bulletin and on the screen. How clearly the sky reveals God's glory. How plainly it shows what he has done. No speech or words are used. No sound is heard. Yet their message goes out to all the world and is heard to the ends of the earth. God made it all in the sky for his son. It comes out in the morning like a happy bridegroom, like an athlete eager to run a race. It starts at one end of the sky and goes across to the other. Nothing can hide from the sea. The law of the Lord is perfect. It gives new strength. The commands of the Lord are trustworthy, giving wisdom to those who lack it. The laws of the Lord are right, and those who obey them are happy. The commands of the Lord are just, and they give understanding to the mind. Reverence for the Lord is good. It will continue forever. The judgments of the Lord are just. They are always fair. They give knowledge to me, your servant. I am rewarded for obeying them. No one can see his own errors. Deliver me, Lord, from wicked faults. Keep me safe also from willful sins. Don't let them rule over me. Then I shall be perfect and free from the evil of sin.
The second lesson is written in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, found in the New Testament Pew Bible, page 221. For the message about Christ's death on the cross is nonsense to those who are being lost. But for us who are being saved, it is God's power. The scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and set aside the understanding of the scholars. So then, where does that leave wise or the scholars or the skillful debaters of this world? God has shown this world's wisdom is foolishness. For God in his wisdom made it impossible for people to know him by means of their own wisdom. Instead, by means of the so-called foolish message we preach, God decided to save those who believe. Jews wanted miracles for proof, and Greeks looked for wisdom. As for us, we proclaim the crucified Christ, a message that is offensive to the Jews and nonsense to the Gentiles. But for those whom God has called, both Jews and Gentiles, this message is Christ, who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For what seems to be God's foolishness is wisdom than human wisdom, is wiser than human wisdom. And what seems to be God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. If you are able, for the reading of this morning's gospel, it is from the gospel of John chapter 2, beginning with verse 13. It was almost time for the Jewish feast of Passover, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons, and also the money changers sitting at their tables. He made a whip from cords and drove all the animals out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. And he ordered the men who sold the pigeons, take them out of here. Do not make my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that the scripture says, my devotion for your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. The Jews came back at him with a question. What miracle can you perform to show us that you have the right to do this? Jesus answered, tear down this house of God, and in three days I will build it again. You are going to build it again in three days, they asked him. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, but the temple Jesus spoke of was his body. When he was raised from death, therefore, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had said. This is the gospel of our Lord on this day. Please be seated. And at this time, I would invite the children of the congregation to come forward for your time. Cassie is our presenter today of Autumn's Message. All right, do you all have a favorite toy you like to play with? No? You have to have a favorite toy. Would you let me play with your favorite toy, or would you want to keep it safe and at home to make sure nothing happens to it? Keep it at home? It doesn't feel nice when things we like get ruined. Jesus understands that feeling, too. In today's lesson, Jesus went into the temple, which is like a church, and he discovered that people were using the temple for the wrong reasons. Some people were taking advantage of other people and selling things for really high prices. This made Jesus very upset. He told the bad people that he would tear the temple down and rebuild it in three days. Now, Jesus didn't mean he would physically tear the temple down. He was referring to the fact that he would die and be resurrected three days later, and he did that just for us. He wanted to make the temple a safe place for everyone to go. God made us because he loves us, and Jesus sacrificed himself 
for us so we can worship God. We have new life because of Jesus' sacrifice, so we want to worship him and thank him. When we focus on loving and serving God, we thank God and Jesus for everything that they have done for us and all the love they have given us. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us unconditionally. Help us show that love to others as we continue to worship you. Amen. fun to watch the kids. All that energy. Remember when, when all of us had as much energy as our kids do? <laughs> okay, our gospel for today is John's account of Jesus' cleansing of the temple. Now we are perhaps more familiar with the cleansing of the temple as it appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In those gospels, it's one of the earlier events in Jesus' final week of life and it follows his grand entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In the Gospel of John, the temple cleansing is actually one of the early events in the chronology of Jesus' entire public ministry, and it follows his first miracle of turning the water into wine at Cana. Now, in John, Jesus is angrier than he seems to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we see him stepping into the role of a righteous prophet in our gospel. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is the religious leaders who are the angry ones and who, in fact, begin plotting to take Jesus' life after witnessing this event. In John, the religious leaders who were there just seem to be caught completely off guard and surprised and like they're trying to figure out what is going on with this upstart young man. They asked Jesus, well, what sign can you show us? What miracle can you perform you know, to do this? 
Their question provides Jesus with an opportunity to make an early prediction of his resurrection. Destroy this temple, and he means the temple of his body, and in three days I will raise it up. This response discredits him in the eyes of the religious authorities who think he's talking about tearing down the temple and rebuilding it in three days, but it will awaken faith in his disciples and in a later generation of his followers. For John's gospel was actually written after the temple, in fact, had been destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the first century. And that loss of the temple was a real crisis, both for the early Christians and for the Jews, since Jesus' Jewish followers had continued to practice the Jewish traditions. And so the very first readers of John's gospel would have been comforted by Jesus' answer in John's account of the temple cleansing. Even with the temple now gone, they could remain strong in faith because Jesus had been raised. Even with the circumstance of that brutal defeat of their community by the imperial power of Rome, there was hope in the demonstration of God's power over death manifest in Jesus' resurrection. And that hope is our hope as well. For as the Apostle Paul says in our second lesson, we believe in Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. As a scholar notes that well, the Jewish Messiah was expected to free the people from Roman rule, not to die on a Roman cross. And in the philosophy of the Gentiles, there was no concept of a God who could become human and die. And if the truth be told, many of us in the modern world, well, we kind of prefer to gloss over Good Friday and instead to celebrate Easter. You know, the anticipation of Advent appeals to us more than the penitential time of Lent they were on the same day this year, but many celebrants of Valentine's Day were not in church for Ash Wednesday services or didn't observe Ash Wednesday in any way. And some of us likewise were not here because of the weather. But the weather is not the reason why so many people in our day and age no longer observe the start of the season of Lent. We love Easter, but we have mixed feelings about walking with Christ on his journey to the cross. That cross of Christ can be a stumbling block for us just as it was to the people of the ancient world. But we, who are people of faith, we do believe in Christ crucified. And many of us have observed Lent for many years, and we know its value. The more closely we can walk with Christ on his journey to the cross, the more fully we will be able to celebrate his resurrection on Easter day. The more fully we can acknowledge ourselves to be sinful human beings, vulnerable in so many ways, the more gladly we will receive that good news of our Easter freedom from the power of sin and death. For all of us who have embraced Lenten disciplines, maybe attended Lenten services, or perhaps studied Lenten devotional materials, Easter will bring more than a one-day celebration we just might experience the renewal of faith which Easter makes possible. We just might be and become people of changed hearts and minds, people whose lives are richer because we know ourselves to be God's people. Our Easter faith brings to each of us the assurance that sin, sickness, and death will not be the last word spoken upon our lives, nor will sin, sickness, and death be the last word spoken upon our world, this good earth of God's creation. 
You know, the hope of our faith may look like foolishness in the eyes of the world. The un to the unbelievers, it may look like the naive idealism of the very young. But we people of faith know our hope is not naive. And in the eyes of the unbelievers in the world out there, the hope of our faith may prove a stumbling block to those who cannot look beyond the world of the senses, the things we can see and hear and taste and touch. But we who are people of faith know that our senses do not give us the wideness of God's own vision. We who are people of faith know our God to be the one who took on human form and did experience the fullness of life, including death, even that cruel death on the cross. We know our God to be the one who overcame death by raising Jesus. And we know our God to be the one who overcomes the power of sin, sickness, and death on behalf of each of us and all of us. May we continue to walk with Christ on his journey to the cross as we move through this season of Lent. May our wrestling with the power of sin through this time prepare us for Easter. Amen. Please stand once more if you are able. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. 
Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. And now we confess the faith that does bring us into the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, for the well-being of creation, and for this world in need. O oh God, you alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the entire church to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the joyful good news of your deliverance. Your mercy is great, O oh God. You renew creation, drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect all of this good earth of your creation. Unite nations, policymakers, and all persons in an effort to preserve the beauty of your creation for the future generations. O oh God, your mercy is great. You judge the nations, Lord. We pray for an end to war and strife in so many places, so many places around the world. Strengthen all who are peacemakers. Your mercy is great, O oh God. You bring healing and hope. We pray for all who are sick that your healing hand might rest upon them. And especially on this day, we pray that you might be with Evelyn who prepares for surgery, that you might be with Wally who prepares for surgery to combat cancer, we pray that you might be with Tim and Joyce, and we pray that you might be with the little newborn, Jackson. Bless all of those whom we have named with your healing presence. And we know there are others in need, and we lift them and their needs before you now, speaking their names on our lips and in our hearts. And, O oh God, you do bring life from death. We remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your eternal love. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
are you, Lord God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the eternal mystery of faith. your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Go now in peace, knowing that God does go with you. Amen.
in peace, knowing that God does go with you. Amen. online. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world in the name of Jesus, the bread of life.
Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, share your bread, 